We're going to begin this video with a short recap of the key concepts of the mitochondrial electron transport chain and connect those to see how these key concepts can be used to actually produce ATP in the mitochondrion. So the most important reactant molecules in the electron transport chain are our electron carrier molecules NADH and FADH2 produce mostly in the Krebs cycle, but also in the cytoplasm via glycolysis. And when each of these bind to a specific large enzyme complex, that being um, NADH dehydrogenase complex 1, and um, I believe this is called fumarate dehydrogenase complex 2, what NADH and FADH do is they transfer their electrons into those proteins there where the electrons basically undergo an electromagnetic relay where they are passed from protein to protein within the electron transport chain generating effectively an electrical current. Now simultaneously when the electrons are let go NADH and FADH2 are also going to release all of the H plus ions that they're carrying into this area of the mitochondrial matrix inside of the inner membrane. Now, as we recall, when we talked about the electron transport chain, electrons never move by themselves because this negative charge is naturally going to attract positive charge which means that every time electrons move through one of the mitochondrial membrane complexes that also acts as a transport protein, the movement of electrons causes H plus ions to be pumped out of the mitochondrial matrix where the Krebs cycle occurs and into the space between the inner and outer membranes, which is what we call the mitochondrial intermembrane space of course referring to the fact that it is between the outer and inner membranes now this is critical because number one as the concentration of h plus inside of the mitochondrion or inside of the matrix rather decreases we are creating a hypotonic situation where our solute concentration the concentration of h plus is low while simultaneously creating a high concentration of H plus that exists in the intermembrane space, thereby creating a hyper, caught myself before I made that mistake there, a hypertonic situation within the intermembrane space. Now, because of the fact that H plus is an ion, not only are we creating a concentration gradient from the high concentration of H plus, but we are also creating what is called an electrochemical gradient. And this is simply because of the fact that H plus is an ion. The fact that we are pumping H plus into the intermembrane space means that we are increasing the amount of positive charge in the intermembrane space. And as the amount of positive charge in the matrix decreases, that means conversely, we are making the inside of the matrix more negative. What this means is that H plus really, really, really wants to come back into the mitochondrial matrix. Firstly, because if you notice in the mitochondrial outer membrane, there aren't actually any channel proteins that H plus can move through, and therefore H plus cannot pass through the outer membrane but simultaneously they are not able to pass through the inner membrane either without a specific transport protein and as it turns out that transport protein has a name this giant multi-protein complex which is a combination of an open channel protein as well as an enzyme inside of the matrix is what we call the atp synthase complex and if i can spell that properly we can see that the name tells us exactly what this protein does from the prefix synth we can derive that this is involved in the synthesis of something and that something is atp so as the h plus diffuse through this 
channel protein, the, a the channel in the ATP synthase protein, what exactly is this protein doing? Well, to start off, let's talk about why we even need this protein at all to synthesize ATP. And if you think back to the substrate level phosphorylation, this will all become relatively intuitive. Now, ADP, the precursor molecule to ATP, where we need to add a phosphate onto, this reaction does not happen very easily because of the extremely strong repulsion that a phosphate with a negative 3 charge has being repulsed by two phosphates that are already uh, present. And therefore, in order to force this phosphate to do something that it doesn't want to do, that being forming a bond with the second phosphate on ADP, a large energy input is needed. And the way that this is done in substrate level phosphorylation is we take this phosphate and make it even more unstable by putting it on a specific substrate of glycolysis or Krebs cycle, but we cannot do that here. We do that using ATP synthase, which goes about this in a completely different way. So the idea of the ATP synthase enzyme and channel protein is that it uses the movement of H plus from the mitochondrial intermembrane space, which naturally wants to diffuse back through the intermembrane space and back into the mitochondrial matrix because of the concentration and electrochemical gradients that we have created thus far. Now, as it diffuses through the channel protein that occurs in ATP synthase, the movement of that H plus does something interesting. So if we look on the inside of the channel downward, we can see that it actually has a turbine-like structure, not unlike the structure that is found uh, in the turbines of a hydroelectric dam. And this wheel that actually literally does spin has R groups that are negatively charged in its tertiary structure here. And this allows H plus to form temporary ionic interactions with these negative charges. So as the H plus moves through this channel protein here, it attracts to the negative charges on the inside of this protein turbine and actually causes this turbine to spin. And this is what drives the catalyzation of the formation of ATP. So how exactly does this work? Well, when the H plus is actually driving this protein turbine, it is generating kinetic energy, that being the energy that comes from the natural movement of one substance to a different location. And we know that this kinetic energy is going to be very, very strong because not only does this H plus naturally bump into each other and push each other into an area of low concentration, but all of the charge repulsion and attraction toward the negative area inside the matrix is going to drive H plus in naturally with lots of kinetic energy. And when this kinetic energy is applied to the protein turbine, uh, that makes up the actual enzyme of this structure, that kinetic energy is transferred to the actual active site of the enzyme that powers the enzyme enough to force phosphate to join with ADP and produce ATP as a consequence of this. And this idea, the idea that the kinetic energy is the force that drives the powering of this enzyme here is what we call a proton motive force, uh, or simply the force that drives this turbine led by H plus ions, also called protons. And the other name that some biochemistry textbooks use to describe this process is the process of chemiosmosis, uh, that being uh, rather than the osmosis of water, this is the osmosis of H plus ions, better known as diffusion. Uh, but the term chemiosmosis is used specifically for this process here. And it is that conversion of kinetic energy of the movement of H plus 
into the energy that the enzyme uses to drive this reaction forward that allows the attachment of a phosphate onto ATP, thereby completing the process of cellular respiration. In the final video in this series, we're going to do a complete summary of all three of the stages of cellular respiration in order to look at exactly how much ATP we can generate from a single molecule of glucose under ideal circumstances.